uh, please put your hands together for Tamir. Okay, and you're talking about generating generators, right? Yes, I am. Ooh. How do I make it present? Though? In case of power failures. Do you want to go to the start slide as well? Yeah, it's computers in it. It's hard. It generating generators. That sounds very meta, doesn't it? If you think about code generation already is quite meta, but generating things that also generate, I mean, this is quite exciting. What do you think of that, V? Sounds interesting, doesn't it? The first thought that came to my mind was machine tools, because that's how you, you know, make generators. Like, mm. But I think this is a programming talk. Not okay. Yeah. A programming talk? <laughs> <laughs> no one told me. Something tells me you're going to enjoy this. Please put your hands together for Tamir. Can I get a clicker? Thank you. So, um, hello, I'm Tamir. And before we begin, I just want to make sure I'm walking on the stage during the talk. And I've been told that if I fall off the stage, the people on the stream would not be able to see me. So if you see me getting up to here or something like that, please tell me. Just say stop so that I do not fall. Let's try it once. Good. Now, now we can begin. Now, I'm going to talk about generating generators, uh, which is a fun thing we can do in Go. And let's start. First, I want to talk about myself for a bit, which is a natural thing to do. Uh, I'm relatively new to Go. I've been coding in Go for about a year now. Uh, before that, most of my uh, experience has been Python and C++. So you can see that some of that experience might have been challenging switching from those languages to Go. And on the one hand, I had to let go of some features, like a lot of metaprogramming in C++, memory management, which actually that's nice to be rid of, and some features of Python that were really nice in Python, but not relevant in Go. Uh, on the other hand, Go has so much good going for it. It's relatively simple. Uh, the tooling is amazing. The ecosystem is wonderful. And when I want to deploy something, I just send one binary. Don't need to force people to install Python. Don't need to spread a huge amount of libraries for C++. It just works. Uh, but even through that, as I learned more Go and got used to the idioms, there's still one thing that I kept missing from Python. And uh, that thing is generators. Now, before we go forward, I just want to say, Simply, generators are a way to create iterators uh, in a simple and straightforward way. Now, before we dig into that, I want to talk about my workflow when I'm dealing with new APIs. Uh, after all, everyone, <laughs> once in a while, we encounter a new API. It can be some remote REST API. It can be something local, just a data structure that we've not dealt with before. And when we do that, we want to know what the data is that we're dealing with. I mean, documentation is nice, and reading the structures is nice, but at least for me, seeing the actual data that I'm, that I'm going to be operating on is a huge help. So the first thing I do is write some hacky print function just to get the data in and print it to the console. And that's about it. So here we have a simple library structure. I'm guessing you're familiar with libraries. Some of them have rooms. In the rooms, there are shelves, and on the shelves, there are books. It is a relatively simplistic example, obviously, but you see later it gets more complicated. When I get the book, I want to print it out, and then I can continue. Uh, specifically, when I'm doing that, if I have an error, I just panic. I know we should not panic on errors. It's really bad. But later, when I keep refactoring the code, I can, change, I can look for panics and replace all of them. If I'm silencing the errors, it's sometimes really hard to find those places, and then we'll get issues in production. Now, once I have that down, and I know the data, I know what the books look like, and I want to start working with them. And the next thing that I need to do is start writing the business logic, but I need to decide where to place the business logic. One simple option would be to just place it instead of the print function. This works, but as the business logic uh, becomes more complicated and more people uh, use that code, it's going to get really, really ugly and really hard to maintain. I mean, we don't want to put everything in one single big function. The next thing we can do is we can query all the data in advance, put in a slice, and then work with that slice. But if we have a lot of data, or if we need to make network calls to get that data, we usually don't want to get it all in advance. We want to do it on demand, when we actually need that data. And for that, we can use iterators. Iterators provide a way for us to get our data on demand, but loop over it as if we were using a slice. 
Uh, they have a relatively simple, simple interface. First, we create an iterator, in this case, with the iter books function. It returns an iterator over the books. Then, we call the next method of the iterator. Next method returns a Boolean. If it's true, it means that there is a value uh, to get from the iterator. If it's false, the iteration is complete. Then, we call the value method to get that value out of the iterator and use it. And finally, when we're done with the iteration, we call the error method to check whether we stopped because we exhausted all the values in the iterator or because we just had an error and we need to handle it. Again, as I said, I'm panicking here, but you shouldn't do it. Now, iterators are great, but implementing them, that can be quite a hassle in Go. And first, they are usually comprised of roughly five parts. The first, is a struct. We need some struct to maintain the state of the iterator. After all, we're changing that state with each call to next, and we need to know what's going on. Next, we have a constructor for the iterator, because sometimes the construction is not trivial, and we don't want to hassle the user with that. Then we have three getter methods. And two are very trivial getters, value and error. They just return the value or the error stored in the in iterator structure. The last one, next, is the method that's doing all the heavy lifting. When you call next, you want to advance data from the current state and the current value to the next one. So all the actual processing is happening inside that one method. Now, that's quite a lot of code to put on a slide, so we're going to do something a bit simpler here. We're going to use the closure iterator uh, structure to simplify things. With that, we can take all those five pieces and compress them into a single function with a single closure inside it. First, we have our range iterator function. Here, we return a closure iterator. That replaces the constructor, effectively. Then, you have a few variables in what we'll call a state block. It saves the state of the iterator. This allows us to just use variables that would be captured by the closure instead of a struct. Then, instead of the next function, uh, we have an advanced one, which is just a different naming. And instead of returning true or false, uh, we also call the with value with error or exhausted method uh, functions. If we return exhausted, it means that we just exhausted the iterator. If we return with value, it means that we have a value to return, and the iteration continues. And if we return with error, it means that we encountered an error, and we need to stop. You know, let's go back to the previous example, uh, the really simple nested loop printing all the books. Uh, and let's see how it's implemented as an iterator. This is the code we get, which is quite a bit longer and has quite a few issues, in my opinion. Uh, first, we have some weird initialization. We're initializing the book index to minus 1 instead of 0, just to make the iteration simpler later. Uh, we have some weird index things going on. And the most critical part, we're iterating in the wrong order. Instead of starting with the rooms and then moving to the shelves and then the books, we're starting with the books, going to the shelves, and then the rooms. This does not look anything like the code we just saw before. And so coming into that, you won't necessarily know what it's even doing. Where is all that Go simplicity? Um, and I'm, I'm sure some of you may have better solutions to that, but I did not. This took me quite a bit of time to implement, and I had to write tests to make sure that it actually works. While here, I just, you, you can see that it works, it's a simple loop. And yeah, sure, there may be better ways to do that in Go right now. And you can train on that and be really good at implementing iterators. But the next person look, looking at the code would not be as good as you are. And so that becomes a real maintainability issue. And often makes you avoid iterators altogether. I mean, why would I do it if it's so much work and it's so easy to make bugs there and it's hard to use later? So we're going to use generators. Here's the same code, but implemented with a generator. You can see the iter books function, and you can see the print all books function we had before. There are three differences altogether. First, uh, instead of having no return value, we return a generator. Uh, for our purposes, a generator implements the same iterator interface. Then, instead of printing, we yield the value. We'll get into exactly what that means in a moment. And finally, because it's a function with a return value, we have to return something. We're returning nil. So what's actually going on here? Well, all generators are created using a generator function. Generator function is any function that uses yield. Uh, when we call a generator function, instead of executing the function, we just return a new generator and not execute any code inside that function. 
as you can see here, we call iter books and we return a generator. Then, when we call next, we start executing the generator function. We execute it all the way until we encounter the yield, uh, the yield call. When we do that, we return true from next and store the value uh, so that it can be fetched later. Then, when we call iterator.value, we get that value that you just yielded. Then, on the next call to next, uh, we keep going, either we encounter next yield again, or we get a return, uh, return statement. When we get a return statement, we just stop iteration. Now, if you had an error to report, we just return that error, and we'd get it through the error method. Here, we don't have an error, so we just return nil. And that's with generator syntax. Now, sadly, as, as nice as that looked, that is currently, at least, and as far as I know, it's not planned anytime soon, that is not Go. It's pretend Go that I wrote to sh demonstrate what we're going to do. Uh, I want that to be Go. It would be really nice for me because I like that code, but that's not Go. It will not run today. So one option was, OK, sure, I can change the compiler or submit a proposal, and, but I want you all to be able to experiment with that as well. So what I did instead is use code generation. It is to take the code, our pretend Go, and create from that actual Go code that can execute. And we're going to use some Go tricks to do it because Go really has amazing tooling to solve that issue. First, we're going to use Go generator. When you have a, fun a file with pretend Go, and it defines generators, we're going to add a Go generate line to run our generation tool and generate the file, the new code. Then we're going to add a build tag. Specifically, I named it GenGen for generating generators. It will allow us to separate the fake Go code, the pretend code with the generator definitions, from the actual code with the generator um, implementations. So generated code would not have the same tag, and then we know that they do not conflict, and we can just run the implementations. Uh, so next thing you have to do is start transforming the code from our generator definitions that using our pretend Go to actual Go code. Here we start with the simplest generator possible, uh, which is an empty generator that basically returns no, uh, yields no values. First thing we do is we copy that generator code, just the body of it, the return nil, into a closure iterator, uh, into the advanced function. Then we replace return nil with return exhausted, because that's all we want to report. Generator is exhausted. Next, the next simplest one is just returning an error. This works the same, but instead of returning exhausted, we return with error and return the error that we had. Again, we're generating that code, and only the new code would be compiled. And next, we yield values, because that's the core of an iterator. Like, saying, I have an error, I have no values to report, that's not interesting. We want to have actual values. So here we have a hello world uh, generator. And if you're wondering, the yield function is just a placeholder. It does nothing. So the first thing you do, again, is copy that code into the advanced method. Then we replace the yield with return with value, as we dis uh, discussed previously. Now, we have an issue. If we keep calling that advanced function, we will always return the same value. We will never stop, because we never reach return nil. Uh, for that, we're going to use quite a bit of uh, messy code. See? Uh, we're going to use go-tos and labels. Uh, to mark the parts of the code where we want to execute, we're going to add a label. One at the beginning of the original function, before the yield, and one after the yield. Then. We're going to add a switch statement at the beginning of the function to decide where we want to go. Do we want to go to the first statement, the first label, or the second one? Lastly, in the state block that we mentioned before, we had, the next, we had a variable to tell us which label we need to go to. And before we turn from the function, we change that variable to the right value. And then, first time going to the function, we reach return with value. And the second time, we'll reach return nil which will be replaced again with return exhausted, because we just terminated the iterator. Now, we are using goto, which is great. It might scare some of you. But you need to remember that Go's goto is not C's goto. C's goto is a mess. Go's goto, which again you should not use unless you have a really good prison, is a lot safer. Uh, there are two, thing, two limitations added in Go that make it really nice to use. Well, not nice to use, but less dangerous. One, we cannot skip over variable declarations. So uh, think about it. If you have a variable declaration, you use a Go to do jump over it. What is the state of that variable? Is it initialized? Is it not initialized? What's going to happen? I don't want to think about it. So Go just disallows it entirely. And the same for blocks. Uh, 
In C, you can just jump wherever. You can jump into the middle of a block. Now, consider an if statement. You have a condition that should hold for all the code inside that block. If that does not hold and you just jump into it, your code is going to act very odd and might eventually have serious issues. So we just disallow that as well. Those two things are impossible in Go. But in our generators, obviously, we're going to define variables because we need them. And we're going to have blocks because we are doing control flow. So we need to circumvent those issues. And the first issue, variable declarations. And instead of keeping them inside the function, we're just going to take all of the variables that we define and move them all into the state block. And this does two things. One, it means that all the go-tos are going to be after the variable declarations, so we're good. And the other thing is, we need to maintain the state of those variables between different calls to advance, and that solves us automatically for us because they are captured by the closure. Next, blocks. Blocks generally have two purposes. One is scoping of variables, and two is control flow. Since we took all the variable definitions out of the blocks, they no longer do any scoping, and they only do control flow. And again, using GoTo's, we can achieve similar results without blocks. Uh, let's look at an if statement. Here we have an if, and we have the control flow graph that represents that if we start with a condition, then if the condition is true, we go to the then block. If it's false, we go to the else block. And eventually, we go to the after block, or whatever is after that if. Now, let's see what we need to do to transform that and get all the code out of the blocks. First, we had a couple of labels. Uh, they don't do anything. They just mark the relevant parts of our code. Then, we had a couple of go-tos. Those go-tos are useless, and they just replicate the same behavior we already had, which is, at the end of each block, jump uh, after the loop, uh, the statement. Then, uh, we can take the blocks, move them out, and use a bit of redirection with go-tos to jump to them. Now, if we have the condition and it's true, we, go to the, we have the go to then label, we jump to the code that was originally inside, perform the three yields, and then go to the after label. So the flow is maintained, even though we don't need to use the blocks. This means that now we can add a label after each yield statement and just jump to there. Uh, that's it for the if. Now we're going to go through a few other control structures and see what we do with them. First, a forever loop. Here we have a simple loop that iterates infinitely. And the first thing we do, as we did before, we add labels. They don't change anything, but they give us the general structure. Then we add a go to to jump from the end of the loop block to the beginning. And now, if you can see, we have an infinite loop already without using the for statement. So we can just remove it. And we have an infinite loop, just as we did before, but no blocks. So again, we can label wherever we want. Next, we have a while loop. And a while loop is nice because it combines two things we already used before. A forever loop, it loops infinitely, and an if statement. Uh, so let's model it as those. See, now we have a loop, an infinite loop, with a condition, uh, with a condition inside it. And since we already transformed both of those structures, we just repeat the same transformations and get this. And um, you may notice that I missed the jump to the loop head here, but it should be uh, right after the increment. And this gives us, a, again, a while loop. Next, we have C style loops, which we will again construct using all the things we've seen before. Uh, we define a variable, declare a variable that would jump to the state loop, to the state block. Uh, we transform the loop into a while loop, and we add the increment inside the, uh, the loop. From here, we can do what we did before. The main difference here that we need to notice is if we have a continuous statement inside the loop, instead of going to the loop head, it should go right to the increment. Otherwise, we'd skip the, the increment. Uh, the last uh, structure we're going to cover today is a for range. This is similar to what we did before, but slightly different, because here we don't have an explicit variable to hold the state. When we iterate over a slice, we just go over it. If you just tell me to stop at a certain point, I can't really tell you where I am and continue from that point. So for that, uh, we're going to use adapters. And adapters take a slice or a map or a channel and convert it into an iterator that we can use the iterator interface with next and value to iterate over. And then, again, an iterator has a variable definition, which we handled before. It has a while loop, a for with a condition, and it has the body of the loop. All of that has been modeled before, so we could just use that. And for a map, 
we have an extra complexity because we need to first convert it into a slice uh, because we need to guarantee that the order is OK every time we access it. And of course, the order of iteration over map is not guaranteed, and we don't want to just duplicate values. And so there are more control structures in Go. Uh, some of them can be modeled, uh, most of them. Some of them don't really make sense. Think of defer statements. If you defer a function's execution, where is it going to run? When is it going to run? When we finish execution of the entire uh, generator, when we finish a single iteration, it doesn't really make sense to model. But everything else can be modeled, even if it's a bit, uh, a bit of work. Uh, so we've, saw, we've seen what generators are, how they help us write iterators. We've gone through the basics of the implementation. Uh, the last thing to do now is a demo. Uh, here, we can see the code for a Fibonacci sequence generator. Uh, we can see the build tag at the top. Uh, we can see us importing the GenGen package, which we'll use. We have the Go generate line to actually generate that code. And we have the uh, generator itself. We have two values, we initialize two variables, we initialize them to one. And then in an infinite loop, we just keep uh, pumping up the value, out the values. Yes, and we'll go and overflow fairly quickly, but that's not the point here. Then we write Go generate to generate our code, and we get something that looks like this, more or less. First, you can see the, gen, the not GenGen tag in the top, which means that those files would never conflict, and that this file would actually get compiled. And then you see the actual the implementation of the generator. This time, no yield and no weird returns, just regular Go code. And you can see the double underscore before next, just to make sure that it doesn't conflict with any variable names defined in the original function. And all we have left to do is run it. So we create a Fibonacci generator, and we loop over it. Of course, we only want to take 10 items out of it, and not let it run infinitely, because that won't stop. And we run, and we get the Fibonacci sequence. And that's it. 